What's good, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, part, of course, of the Cover One Sports Network. I'm one of your two hosts this evening, Anthony Prohaska, joined, as always, by Eric Turner. And Eric, we've got a fun one. Well, we've always got a fun one here. Yeah. But we've got some more game tape to go through. We've got the culmination of the preseason for the Buffalo Bills. We've got some Bills, Bears game tape to go through, dive into some player pieces and some some folks that we wanted to highlight for uh, their play in that game, as we do Mm -hmm show but we've also got some new additions to the buffalo bills roster whose table we will be be diving tonight right tackle jermaine effetti uh of the well most recently of the detroit lions and several other teams and linebacker christian kirksey most recently of the houston texans two guys that you tabbed uh over the past couple of days and add to positions of need for this buffalo bills team so we're going to dive into their tape we got a lot on deck for tonight should be a good one action-packed episode things were changing behind the scenes when it came to film the discussions and topics right up until the show started basically um there's been a lot of news the last couple days as ant said we you know we have some film on the bears we have some film on guys that made the roster that you know were kind of fringe guys uh we want to highlight some of their play just not in the bears game but over the course (laughs) of the um preseason and then uh as you said the the new signees and uh it's it's been fun, man, but it's been a lot of work just to get to this point. And guys, buckle up, hang in there with us. We have a, a pretty extensive show, uh, but it's going to be fun. I mean, we're talking football here. It's going to be fun. It's not work. This is all good times. Drop us your questions. Your, you know, hit that like button. Drop us a comment. Um, help us out here. Help us out. We're going to be here for a little while. So grab your beverages and uh, mm-hmm. hang out with us. You know, it's funny. We, uh, you know, not too much of a peek behind the curtain, but we we've got some things uh, cooking behind the scenes here, cover one, especially for myself and Eric and mm-hmm. Eric. It's funny, like we we had gone over kind of like the outline for that stuff, like early in the week. And I had everything prepped. I was like, oh, I'll be done with Bears Bills game tape by Sunday night, Monday, and then I can dive into everything else. And then we started thinking these moves might happen. And then these moves did happen. And yet yeah, your point, like it's never really worked, but it is to a degree to dive into the tape. But it's for good reason. And, you know, Eric, we've we've talked on this show, even when going over the positives, we talked on this show about some of our concerns for the depth at the tackle position, and even some of our concerns with Spencer Brown as a starting right tackle. And then flip that to the defensive side of the ball. We've had concerns about the linebacker position. It's been a heavy, mm-hmm. heavily discussed topic. We talked about it early in February talking about what this defense could look like without Tremaine Edmonds. And then we talked about potential fillers. Didn't really see anything happening. We've saw how that progressed through this off season, high level perspective before we really dive into everything here. How do you feel, you know, about being in this organization, being pretty proactive or maybe reactive based on where we are in the off season, but really not just standing pat, not sitting on their hands and going out and actively trying to raise the floor at both the tackle position and the linebacker position. Yeah, it, it was going to be a challenge, right? It was going to be a challenge after they weren't able to address address it this offseason really um, in the draft or or through free agency. And so they were relying on some names, some players to elevate their game, grow a little bit you know, within their game, and develop a little more. Um, but through the preseason, I think all of us started to see there are going to be some challenges, and there were going to be some challenges. So we were expecting as soon as some of these releases, especially if you're talking like veterans that, you know, maybe there's a younger guy that was drafted or brought in and knocked him out of the starting position, you know, like a Christian Kirksey or, mm-hmm. you know, he's getting up there in age and maybe his athleticism and, and overall play is um, maybe not what it was years ago. And when you started to see some of these guys get cut free, released or, um, or waived, uh, you just knew Brandon Bean wasn't going to stand pat. I mean, that's really his MO. He's always looking to improve. He tells us that pretty much every time the camera's in front of him. He's always looking to improve. It doesn't matter what the position is. And he's proven that um, even more so this, this uh, you know, offseason as the preseason, you know, finishes. And you got to see some of these guys he picked up in Effetti and Kirksey. Um, Kirksey didn't play in the preseason, but he had a really good 2022. Effetti uh, mm. played for the Lions this uh, this year, played a lot of good snaps. We're going to take a look at some of those. Mm. And you're going to see that, hey, he's still got something left, too. And maybe he doesn't, you know, take Brown's spot. But if something happens to Brown or if Brown continues to struggle, uh, you know, carries over from last year, hey, maybe a Fetty can come in and just stabilize the position. Maybe not someone that is going to be an answer long term, but can stabilize the position. I think that's what the Bills and Brandon Bean are looking for by going out and getting 
Christian Kirksey, and Jermaine Effetti. You know, I think it's what we talked a lot about here. And, you know, I think a lot of those sentiments I've, I've echoed, you know, speaking for myself as well, like I, especially a right tackle, it would be amazing if the Bills had like an all pro right tackle or an all pro offensive line, but mm-hmm. just that semblance of stability, like the biggest, and you and I both talked about it. Like the biggest concern with Spencer Brown has been his pass protection. And it's just that roller coaster that he is one rep. You're like, Oh, is he putting it together? And then the next rep, you're like, Nope, he just lost in about a quarter. <laughs> He's not putting it together. And you just, yeah. it's so hard to have any type of consistency and sustainability as a quarterback or as an offense, when you have that potential kind of deficiency always looming at, at a significant part of your offensive line. And they removed that piece at the left guard spot with Roger Saffold by bringing in Connor McGovern, but we're still sitting there with Spencer Brown. And as much as, you know, Ryan Vandermark showed well and Alec Anderson showed well with his versatility, neither of them really spoke to the, the sustainability and stability piece when it came to pass protection at the right tackle spot. A Fetty, like you said, he's not this high ceiling guy. You know, maybe he comes in and has a fantastic year, but, you know, he is kind of who he is, but that's a positive for this team. He adds stability, he raises the floor of the tackle group, and he gives you a known quantity at the position should Spencer Brown continue to struggle. Yeah, and he's got that starting experience. You know, he's played in a lot of games, and uh, most of the most of his work was at right tackle. I think over the course of his career, he's got f- over 4,100 snaps at right tackle, si- over 1,600 at right guard. Now, this preseason... We got to see some of that versatility, and I do think that he's more of a swing tackle than, say, Ryan Vandemark, who they're kind of, you know, right. obviously we're leaning on before this signing, uh, keeping him and making him part of the 53 initially. Yeah. Um, I do think he's, as you said, he the Bills have raised the floor of that position if, if we're talking swing, swing tackle position. Um, so that's always great with some, you know, starting experience. And his arms are just long man yes. 36 <laughs> inches and you'll see in a lot of these clips where he's not the like smoothest mover he's not the most fluid athlete mm-hmm. and in fact his lo- his legs are kind of going he doesn't have much left in his <laughs> legs um but you see his arms make up for so much he wins first touch a lot pretty good hand placement on a lot of his blocks and he's able to absorb power something that we've seen Spencer Brown struggle with his mm-hmm. ability to absorb and anchor power, whether it's a power move that, from the jump or a speed to power move. You see a Fetty just use those long arms, win that first touch and absorb a lot of that power with his arms. It's, it was, it's just, it's pretty cool to see when you look at the type of player he is and the athletic, you know, specimen that Spencer Brown tested out mm-hmm. as early on. And you're just seeing how those guys win in different ways, but also lose in different ways. So, I'm excited about this because of, you know, again, the, the type of player he is. You see right there. I look at this. I mean, this is not even what he's known for. At, he's at left tackle here. He's not known for his run blocking. He's more mm-hmm. of a pass blocker, right? In. Mm-hmm. But look mm-hmm. at the torque and hands on this play to displace that guy off to the side there on that run. So uh, some good stuff here. I, I Again, preseason, keep that context in mind. But do I think he beats out Spencer Brown? No, but I think that if Spencer Brown struggles, this guy does a lot of the things that Aaron Cromer likes when we're talking vertical set, hand usage, being able to anchor um, right in, at the doorstep of the quarterback. So I, I do think that Cromer obviously had a hand, a hand in picking this guy. <laughs> um, so I, I think if Fetty is, uh, I think they've elevated the the floor at the, of the swing tackle position and especially at the right tackle position. That was a good Cromer pun with the hand line. I like it. Well done. Yeah, I think that's a key point, and I, I'm glad that you mentioned it. With with what you have in Spencer Brown, before Effetti came on, if you if it's not working out with Spencer Brown, you really don't have another option because Alec Anderson is more suspect at if you want to have him be your right tackle, even though he's more center guard, they tried him out at right tackle against the Bears. He had some, you know, rough reps in pass pro. He's going to be more of a roller coaster and unknown than Spencer Brown is. Ryan Vandemark, we've talked about Eric on this show, where at left tackle, we're like, oh, maybe he could be a guy. Right tackle, it's like he does not know how to play football. I hate Ryan Vandemark, the right tackle. Ryan Vandemark, the left tackle, I enjoy from time to time. But the point is, if Spencer Brown wasn't going to work out there, you had nowhere else to go. You had no one else to turn to. And at least here with the Fetty, yeah, you've got 
a veteran with good experience and good knowledge and know-how. And I, I echo a lot of your similar sentiments um, when it comes to his analysis. You know, he's not the most mobile. He's not the most athletic, especially when you're juxtaposing him with Spencer Brown. Um, I don't think it's his lack of athleticism or mobility is necessarily a concern, but it's not a strength. But this, like the clip that you're showing right here is what he does so well. You mentioned his ability to anchor and also his ability to absorb. He just consistently like, his ability to just stop edge players momentum and take it on to himself and just stalemate rushers. He, he might flat out just anchor right in the ground and stop, or he'll stalemate and almost steal your energy kind of. And the hand placement, mm -hmm. I highlighted it right there. Like so often, especially when he's winning, I feel like he's got big, strong hands based on you see what happens to edge defenders when he latches on, but it's not just that his hands are big and strong. It's the placement. He'll get them right into the numbers, right into the chest of an edge player. And then Eric, you're pairing that good hand placement and those strong hands with those long arms. It mm -hmm. gives him a significant advantage from rep to rep. And what's nice to see is a player who knows who he is and what he is and being able to play to that consistently winning with that first touch, winning with that good hand placement, knowing who he is. And yeah, I like the pieces you mentioned about the run blocking. I, I thought he was pretty forceful as a down blocker on a lot of reps, being able to wash guys completely down, um, he, working well on combo blocks and creating some vertical displacement. And again, a lot of it is tied to his arm length, the hand strength, the hand placement. And you know, yeah, he, he, he has a lot of the pieces that, Aaron Cromer would like, which makes sense why he was brought in. And at the end of the day, yeah, it raises that floor. I don't think this is the sexiest mm -hmm. move, but you're not going to get a sexy move as you know, you approach September and the preseason is ending, but this is a good move for this team. It adds a known quantity. It raises the floor and it gives you a legitimate person to turn to should Spencer Brown not work out or should Spencer Brown get banged up again. Yeah. And this is a rep against the Jags uh, where he's at left tackle. You see the set and then just watch. He, he basically is – he's lost the half-man relationship. You can see the guy is kind of by him already, but look at that left arm and the placement by the hand. Boom, look at him right there. It's like a magnet. And, I mean, that's perfect hand placement. And then just watch what it does on this play. Like right there, you see he can't turn – and bend and flatten. He can't turn the corner because of that long arm. And look at – I mean, he's extended. Look at the power behind that. He's mm -hmm. able to absorb that power, that speed to power rush, with basically his outside hand, his left hand, and he locks that guy down right at the doorstep of the quarter. That's what I'm talking about. Like, his long arms, he's going to win first touch, and if he can get his hands inside like you're seeing on a lot of these reps, he's going to shut down that that outside edge, that, you know, uh, that play and pass rush that, again, Spencer Brown has struggled with, mm -hmm. you know, allowing that outside edge, that outside hip uh, in speed rushes. And I like this rep right here vertical setting we talk about vertical setting you know he's not taking that 45 degree angle uh set right here he's going vertical so he's helping because of this wide alignment by this guy he's got to help his guard a little bit so he's gonna vertically set and help and use that drag hand you see i was gonna say that hand drag right hand you point that drag hand yep. out all the time when we do tape he yes. i feel like he's throwing it on like 90 percent of his sets like he's consistently aware yeah, and so he uses – and offensive linemen use that drag hand usually as another set of eyes. They always say it's another set of eyes because mm -hmm. a lot of times he's looking at this guy out here. He uses that inside hand as a set of eyes. So when an offense or a pass rusher hits that hand, now he knows he can't keep you know vertically setting and gaining depth towards the quarterback. He needs to become firm to help that guard out. So now that he's right there, look how he just hangs with him, becomes firm with him, and then as that pass rusher approaches – and starts to get into the rush. Now he's there, and again, balls out, and he's right there to really help form this pocket mm -hmm. because of that vertical set and using that drag hand. This is something, again, Cromer asks a lot of his tackles and guard when it comes to these wide pass rush angles. You know, we saw it in that Steelers game, those wide nine rushers, outside linebackers that are out wide with those four-eye techniques, defensive tackles like this. You're going to see that a lot because Cromer likes to keep his tackles on an island a lot, and the interior offensive linemen working together to hold the depth of the pocket, which is what we always talk about. So I like this vertical set. I like his help using that drag hand. And then again, pass rushers committing out wide. He can go out there and get him and balls out. Yeah, he he had a couple reps um, thing against the Giants in the first preseason game where you know, towards as the game progressed, some of those edge rushers were lining up in wider alignments and trying to beat him around the arc. And my thought was like, uh oh, is he going to be able to get there? But he's got enough mobility. And then yeah, with the length. Even this one kind of like to a degree is the 
as the edge rusher tries to test him around the edge. You see this type of action from a Fetty almost regularly when guys try to test the arc around him. Like he can just mm-hmm. get his hands on you and escort you and just kind of set you around your quarterback, allowing, in this case, Teddy Bridgewater to either step up or depending on what's happening on the inside, you can allow your quarterback to either step up in the pocket or escape out the front door. And so his ability with those long arms and his hands, I think it also pairs well with Josh Allen's play style because you have that anchoring ability that can either secure the pocket. So Allen doesn't feel skittish or feels like he has to bail or having that ability to just either push guys and literally chuck them or actually get his hands on them and ride them around the arc. So Allen can either step up or escape. He offers a, a, a calming presence and, also within that too, I, I like you. We, we've seen it a lot in these clips. I think he's patient, but I, I don't, I don't want people to think that means like he's passive. Like he just seems very calm. I don't know if it's his experience or confidence or whatever, but you'll see him in a lot of his sets, even when he jumps out and is like in more uh, aggressive with some jump sets or even more of an aggressive 45, you mm-hmm. see him just, he's patient. Like he's waiting for his man to get close. He has a plan with his hands. He knows what he wants to do. He knows where he wants to place those hands and and what he's going to do against the edge rusher. I just think he offers a nice calming presence, whether he's a depth I guy. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So whether he's a depth guy or he somehow gets into the starting lineup, it's a nice calming presence on that offensive line rather than the kind of herky jerkiness you can get at times now. Yeah, and he's patient, too, because a lot of times on the third kick slide is usually when a pass rusher assumes that a punch is coming out. So one, two, three, and right here he's showing his hands like he's going to punch out, and what does he do? He makes him disappear. He uses a circle Mm -hmm. punch. And so what is this guy doing? He's punching out. He's now showing his move. So what happens? Now he just he can lock him up. And I love your point about how he rides guys around the arc because most of the time what Spencer Brown does, again, slightly different, is he's got the athleticism to you know get a piece of this guy and then run him wide of the spot. If Fetty doesn't have that athleticism, so what does he do? He uses more of his arm length and his mm-hmm. power and grip to lock that guy up and not allow him to run the arc here and then maybe circle back up the, the pocket there to get Josh Allen. So he locks him down in a different way than Spencer Brown can. And again, that comes back to what you said at the top. He's, he's he understands his own strengths and weaknesses mm-hmm. and he understands how to overcome them or mitigate them in many ways and so he he wins in a different way that Spencer Brown does so it'll be uh it'll be interesting to see you know his role and how quickly he can adapt to this system uh, like I said a lot of the techniques he, uh, he's going to be used to especially when we're talking his time with Detroit but mm-hmm. he obviously has to learn a lot of the ins and outs of the pass protections the checks and things like that so it will take some time guys but I do see him uh, fitting in rather well. Um, I, I mean, I had heard that he was uh, already in Buffalo and the background check on him was already done uh, nice. when I started posting this film yesterday. And, and then it came out, I think it was like an hour later from Aaron Wilson that he visited. And then I think officially he signed today. But mm-hmm. um, just uh, I think it's a good signing considering mm-hmm. all of the guys that were out on the market on the street after uh, the preseason and all the releases and whatnot. I like being able to bring him in because, you know, Shell was more of a run blocker. And I think when it came to that portion of his game, I think he's probably much better than Effetti. But in pass blocking, Effetti is much better. And Shell's retirement, whether he got wind that maybe he wasn't going to make the roster or not, I think that really screwed the Bills. I think that really screwed them when you're talking the depth. And uh, I, it, it's obvious that Bean was not happy with just, you know, keeping Vandemark and having, you know, break the glass guys in Ryan Bates, who can play tackle, but more are interior guys. Yeah. Same with Alec Anderson. I, I think if Fetty can at least lock up the right tackle position and depending on what they want to do with Vandemark, I mean, hopefully just leave him to the left <laughs> side. But um, I think if Fetty was a good signing with all things considered and how things transpired. Uh, throughout the preseason, throughout the end of camp, preseason, and then again, kind of uh, during this mm-hmm. cut uh, period. Yeah, and and from a pass protection standpoint, I'm happier with a Fetty than I was with Brandon Shell. I had concerns and worries mm-hmm. about Shell. Um, but exactly to your point, yeah, like it's a good signing, but especially where we are in the off season, um, it's not easy to get somebody who can contribute to your football team, and he can. And I also, I know a lot of people, or not a lot of people, a couple of people got at me last night just throwing up pressure stats from his time in Chicago and uh, previous stops. But I think 
his time in Detroit helped him out being under Hank Fraley there, who's been a mm-hmm. really good offensive line coach. And I mean, granted they've drafted well and developed, but they've got a unit of dudes in Detroit on the offensive line. And some of that is a testament to the scouting and the players themselves, but some of it is also due to Hank Fraley and what he's done being there. I think since 2018 as the assistant O line coach and then the official offensive line coach. So, um, you know, a Fetty comes from a well-coached group now comes into another well-coached group with, with Aaron Cromer. So very nice to see that addition. And now we move on to the other side of the ball. Like we mentioned in the intro, Offensive tackle and linebacker were two uh, positions of concern for us here on the show. We talked about them addressing the first spot with tackle with Jermaine Effetti, and now we get to them addressing the other spot, the linebacker spot, specifically more the middle linebacker spot with Christian Kirksey, uh, most recently with the Houston Texans, was a captain for them. Um, I think this is a really interesting signing, Eric, given his skill set, how he could fit in next to Matt Milano, and more importantly, how his skill set is juxtaposed against the rest of the linebackers that are competing for that starting job. Right. And the bills were interested in Kirksey a few years ago. We did a film study on him. Um, He is a guy that, you know, the bills were likely targeting when Milano was up with his contract uh, at the, you know, obviously more of an outside linebacker position. Uh, So he was, there was some homework done on him, not just by us, but by the team. And even some of the players uh, We're actually the one that ones that broke the story of him even visiting back then too. And, you know, a lot of player he's played with some players on the Bills defense. And so, uh, you know, there was an understanding there and uh, some um, prior history with some of those players and in this scheme, too, because I, I'm pretty sure he also played in Cleveland under uh, Holcomb, L. Holcomb, when he was there. So there is some again, there's some understanding and prior history between these guys. But I was worried you know, when I started watching the film, so I watched his film before I looked at his stats. I want to see where his play speed was at. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you're seeing a lot of these plays that I looked at and I'm like, wow. Okay. You Mm -hmm. see some flashes, but you also see that, okay, he's not quite the athlete that he once was. And, and to be honest, he's playing a different role. He was playing more of a middle linebacker last year, which is one of the first things that popped out on film. Right. And like, so, Um, he, from all accounts and from guys that I've spoken to, he is what he puts on. He's a a leader. He's a communicator on the field, off the field. You see him setting the defense. I mean, really, when you talk about priorities, uh, for the Mike linebacker position in the bills defense, I feel like that's the first thing that always pops up. And so he obviously has that DNA. Um, and he just, he makes some plays. Is he going to cut some corners sometimes and try to, Mm shave an angle and go under a block instead of working over the top. Yeah. And he's going to make some tackle for losses in doing that, but he's also going to get caught in the wash sometimes. But I was uh, pleasantly surprised with how much production he put mm. on, uh, on film last year with the Texans. And so I was not surprised when I was told that the bills were looking into him. I assumed they were going to, and it kind of confirmed that and validated that. And then the film It was a no brainer once you started watching it, right? Yeah. And, you know, we saw it in a couple of these clips. The first thing that stuck out with for me, and it's something, again, we talked about once Tremaine Edmonds left, was the type of coverages that the Bills used to run and a lot of the responsibilities that fell onto Tremaine Edmonds they were able to run those coverages because of his physical ability. Like whether he was that, you know, middle third player in a Tampa two look, or even in a quarters look carrying the number two or carrying the three, he was able to do that because of his size, his athleticism. And Kirksey is not that level of athlete, but he's enough of a fluid athlete that he can function in some of those coverages. And that's the first thing that stuck out to me, especially coming from Houston last year with that Lovey Smith defense. Lovey Smith is one of the major proponents of Tampa too. So there's so many mm-hmm. clips of Kirksey just running that middle third and carrying a tight end. And, Go ahead. And, and, and you, you make a great point about the coverages because you know, who came over from the Texans this year to help the bills in the secondary and with the coverages mm. and it's Joe Dana. So mm-hmm. again, he has an understanding about maybe the, the limitations and what he can and can't do on the field. And so he's going to obviously help a little bit too. When we talk about that prior history. Awesome. Yeah. That's a nice way to help him assimilate and a guy, another coach in the room who knows the type of player that Kirksey is. You can kind of speak to that um, and help him. Yeah. Translate better into this defense. And it's just seeing the athleticism that he has there and watching him being able to carry the number two or carry the three function as that middle third in a Tampa two or in a quarters look um, and watching him being able to move fluidly. 
it, it's nice, especially compared to, you know, I didn't have any faith that Dodson could do it. I didn't have any faith that AJ Klein could do it. I was right. somewhat hopeful uh, for Bernard. Like this play right here is yeah, right here. not even just the interception is ridiculous. Like the way he finishes this off and rips it from Cortland Sutton, but there he is dropping into that middle third with that vertical drop. He's carrying Cortland Sutton, who is a big, strong, fast receiver. You see him right in stride with him. Granted, he knows he's got, you know, some safety spots over the top, but he's sure. right there looks back once he sees Sutton go up for the ball, makes a play, and it's tough to see on um, this angle, but he yeah. gets his hand up in there, as you can see, rips the ball out, and then as Sutton is falling to the ground, the ball is loose. Kirksey grabs it, rolls over, pounces on it, and logs it as an interception. Like The awareness and the athleticism to make that play at the catch point is tremendous. But I throw that up to more of like, well, you know, the ball bounced in a specific way. Granted, he made a play on it. I was just more excited, like, look at him carrying a legitimate receiver vertically. It, like, Yeah, and you know what's funny Ant, is because if you go back to the Bears game, uh, there was one play. I know, I can't remember exactly, but I know JT Sullivan broke it down because he's he was telling uh, the fans and, and viewers that, hey, Field should have threw this bender route over the middle just like that route to Sutton. Because Dotson was smoked. He re he didn't recognize it as quickly as Kirksey did. And he wasn't able to carry it. The guy had like, I don't know, five, six yards separation on uh, the linebacker Dotson. Where, it, again, it's a, it's a similar play. But Kirksey recognized it so much quicker. And he got on his horse. And then, again, making a play on the ball. That's just a whole other dimension that yeah. we just haven't seen from Dotson. Absolutely. Like, being able to make a play on the ball is something you're not getting from Dotson, let alone, like, the athleticism and the speed to carry these guys vertically. And, you know, speaking of the type of athlete that he is, he is smooth. I do think mm -hmm. he is athletic, but he's more, he is more smooth and fluid than he is twitchy. This isn't some dude that's some short bursty closed down type of dude, like in the blink right. of an eye, but he's fluid. He's got the agility. You even seen a little bit on that play um, mm -hmm. against the fullback. Like when he's avoiding blocks, he's dipping that shoulder. He's slipping blocks. He's not going to be, let me take on a block or stack and shed. He's going to use right. his agility. He's going to use his fluidity to attack shoulders, um, defeat blocks at the second level and at the first level with that agility. Um, I like that you mentioned earlier, you know, about him, like kind of taking some shortcuts, he'll shoot gaps versus the mm -hmm. run, like under and over. And sometimes it kind of puts him out of position, but it just speaks to that, you know, that aggressive nature that he has. I like him, um, as a blitzer, he had a bunch of the clips showing him come forward. There's some yeah. shooting the gap right here. Um, yeah, he's he got, really good at this. Like, especially when we're talking gap runs. Oh yeah, that was my next point. Yeah, especially against when you get this yeah. guy going here, and they're kind of blocking down, trying to wash guys down or uh, slanting guys so that he can be aggressive. Like, he's very good at at slicing through, dissecting that, and then tripping up running backs and bringing guys back. Uh, down in the backfield for tackles yeah. and losses, especially, especially in those gap type runs where they're allowing him to process it quickly and then undercut those blockers and down blocks. He just, he just makes so many plays on that. And, but he will get covered up at times when we're talking wide zone runs, mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. zone runs. And you know, the offensive lineman is able to scoop cleanly to him mm -hmm. and get a piece of them. Uh, they, they do cover him up. But again, these gap runs, look at him come down downhill on this versus that gap run. And he just finds just enough, just enough, you know, uh, space to, to avoid a block and to slice through there and to make tackles in the backfield. So he's very opportunistic. And mm. more times than not, he makes the correct you know decision and process. But there are times he does get caught up. But this is the other angle we're not even really talking about his his ability to diagnose blocking schemes and mm. add on as a rusher, whether he's stunting and looping or just adding on as a rusher, as that running back stays in, he somehow ends up on the doorstep of quarterbacks a lot. He had mm -hmm. 17 pressures from the middle linebacker position last year, which is a really nice dimension and someone, something we talked about not with Dotson, but with Terrell Bernard. So mm -hmm. again, I think this is why he is such a great scheme fit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny seeing there's some, misdirection pieces you'll see like in the run game that you know what some rpo looks or um uh different like counter actions and things where he'll kind of like you can see him trying to process it and almost it allow him to get eaten up at times at the second level or like misdiagnose sure. but in in pass protection it's a legitimate gift like when he he'll pause and whether he's green dogging or he's just going he his ability to diagnose protection schemes and either get in 
to the quarterback himself, or what I really love, Eric, his ability to act as that spiker and clear a lane or an alley for another linebacker or another defensive lineman. So he's either getting as a blitzer when he rushes either by design or by read, he's either getting to the quarterback or he's sacrificing himself to clear Look up something diagnose. for a team. Yeah. yeah, this is beautiful. Look like, at him diagnose this short edge. He, yes. He's hogging where that close. rush Look, look right there, and then boom, he's there. See, I love that. I, I love that that perspective for a linebacker, especially if we're talking Mike. Oh, absolutely. Like, and, and we we talk about this a lot when we're talking about defensive line play, and we're talking about loopers and spikers in two man games. Like, you want to come if you're that looper, you want to come around tight, and you want that efficient mm-hmm. angle to the quarterback, and that's what Kirksey does from the second level here. And it's consistent. Like you saw it. He did it against Hertz in one of these clips. He did it against Mahomes. He's doing it here against Matt Ryan. So like a variety of offensive lines, a variety of schemes, a variety of quarterbacks, like, Oh, that one, like the way he just gets into his man and plays through that shoulder. And it allows him to end up getting the pressure as you highlight him right there. But usually he'll do that so he can free up another one of his guys. So it's when he comes, it's either him getting to the quarterback or he's, you know, kamikaze and things at the line of scrimmage and allowing somebody else to make a play. Oh, even that one, the the brief hesitation, the straight line right onto Hertz. He recognizes the protection. He's coming, bears down on Hertz in a heartbeat. You see this with regularity. And that's another nice piece, Eric, as we've talked about some of the potential identity or philosophy tweets. Yeah, beautiful read on this one. He you see this running back coming over here. So instead of coming inside, watch him loop. Yep. Just beautiful. Shout out to Just Jerry Hughes read. there. Shout out to Jerry yeah. Hughes there on Sao Malo. <laughs> yeah, that, but that's that's part. So basically, like, again, we always talk about two-man games from the defensive line perspective. This almost acts like a two-man game with Jerry Hughes, number 55, and then Kirksey coming from the second level. Like, instead of taking on the back, he recognizes that mm-hmm. Hughes is in that gap. So cool, let me put my foot into the ground and twist to the other side, and now you've got that pressure on Jalen Hurts. And we've talked about the potential scheme tweaks or philosophy changes that we'd like to see with the Bills' defense. And speaking to some of that more aggressive nature under Sean McDermott, Kirksey is a move in that direction because of his blitzing ability, because of his ability to close down and attack quarterbacks and protection schemes. All right, so we're getting called out. There's People are saying, oh, these are a lot of highlights, you know, so they want to know what are there, some of the shortcomings. Uh We also mentioned some of the shortcomings already. We did. We did. But, and and you guys have to understand, we show what he can do because that's (laughs) why teams sign these guys. All right. You got to keep that perspective in mind. They're not signing him for what he can't do. Coaches coach to minimize and mitigate (laughs) those weaknesses. So you sign a player, you draft a player for what he can do. So, yes, more times than not, we're showing what he can do. And that's what we're doing in this segment. But we did lead off with some negatives. But (laughs) again, to rehash it, if you want it, some negatives, if you want some of that negativity, yeah, we, we talked about he, he gets covered up at times, especially on wide zone runs. Um, split flow, when they have a tight end that comes mm. across the formation and they run oh. that zone run in the opposite call, he gets caught up in that. And some of that was scheme, but some of that is his eyes, you know, and his processing. That Some of that's on him. Um, what else did I have? Uh, he's going to miss some tackles. And, and you kind of talked about it a little bit, and when it came to – um, you know, fitting up the running back. There are times where I think, again, we see a little drop off athletically where the running back's coming into the gap or he's coming up and, and you see Kirksey kind of fitting him up to tackle him. And that, that running back will accelerate or burst mm-hmm. away or change direction. And the feet of Kirksey can't match it. So you'll see him instead of moving his feet to square the guy up and stay in phase. And when you're come to, to, to fit up the runner, he, his feet stop, his feet and stall, lunge. and he, he lunges, and he uses arm tackles. And so you saw some of those clips where he actually made the tackle and tripped the guy up in the backfield, but there are times where that running back will accelerate away, whether it's because of change of direction or he's got another gear as Kirksey's coming to fit him up. Yeah, I think that's all fair. Um, we also mentioned, you know, some of his aggressiveness and how he like shoots the gaps, but he'll also like kind of take some shortcuts at times and he'll, he'll, try and shoot a gap kind of underneath and it'll put him too shallow on the path to the running back and it'll allow that running back to get more yardage or get past him. Um, Despite the fact that he is athletic and I like how we can function in match coverage, which is something I did not have confidence in um, Dodson or a Klein mentally. I had faith, but physically I didn't think he could do. Um, I do think again, because of that stop start ability, like 
that he doesn't necessarily have. He isn't this change of direction, change of direction, like great footwork, make you miss in a phone booth type mm-hmm. of guy. Like he's more of a straight line sp- speed, fluid athlete type of dude. Um, so based on that, yeah, you're, you're going to have to see how he plays. And Eric, I think that's also a good point too. Like we, you, you want to showcase what a player can do. And I think a, a terrific example of that is, uh, Jalen Hyatt, the receiver from Tennessee, who had a pretty good preseason so far with the Giants, although mm-hmm. it's early on. Brian Dable did so much in those games for Jalen Hyatt, putting him in motion or allowing him to be off the line of scrimmage because so many of the things that Hyatt was being called out about on his tape was, well, yeah. we're not seeing what his release package looks like and what's going to happen if he gets pressed. And so all these negatives and all these detractors. So Brian Dable took him and said, oh, I don't care about all that. Dude can fly, so I'm going to put him in certain alignments that he doesn't get pressed and he doesn't need a release package, and right. I'm going to see if dudes can run with this receiver who can fly. And so Dable leaned into Hyatt's strengths. And again, that's just one example. You bring a guy in and you play to their strengths and you mitigate their weaknesses. The Bills did it uh, in the 2020 season with A.J. Klein. Why do you think A.J. Klein was blitzing like every Yeah, 25%. 25% exactly. of the time. <laughs> because they knew he couldn't cover anymore. So why would you sit here and be like, well, he can't cover. Let's break down why he can't cover. No, we're going to show you what he can do because that's what he's being brought in to do. But even within that, we did want to bring up those negatives and highlight the player as a whole. Yeah, and, and to kind of wrap this segment up, and uh, we're getting asked, like, do we think he can start? I think, especially if we're talking between the two guys they just signed, I think it'll take a couple weeks and Kirksey is going to be Mm. competing to start. I think he's that type of veteran. He's that type of heady player. He's played in several defenses. Some of it, again, it's just terminology. And, you know, it will take time when we talk about all the checks that this defense uses on, on game days. It'll take some time to get some of the nuance to it. But when it comes down to him starting, I would be shocked if he doesn't start in the next few weeks. I'd say... He's going to start competing in two weeks. Who knows after that? It could be even sooner where he's elevated and he could be starting, it, especially if we're talking Dotson starting Bernard over Bernard or, or vice versa, because those mm. guys didn't really separate each other at all. Yeah. Dotson looked rough. Bernard, we didn't even get the C play. Yeah. So really, it, you know, if Kirksey can get up to speed, he's going to compete sooner than later. And this is – uh, this this point that point is twofold because I'm in complete agreements with you on that, and I think one it's a testament to Kirksey, but two, unfortunately, it's a testament to the lack of known quantity and or quality that they have at the linebacker position now. Like I, if if it was between, I'm still you know holding out a little hope for Bernard, and that's the only thing that's playing for in sure. the back of my mind. But if it was between right now, like you just brought in Kirksey, and the only options are Kirksey or Dodson, I, I think. Kirksey's winning that job week one because Dotson's been a dumpster fire in coverage to a degree um, with certain pieces. And yeah, you know, I think he's a smart dude. He's been a captain. He's been around a lot of schemes. He's got a skill set that translates into this scheme based on what he just did in Houston. Dude is a leader. You mentioned, I love the communication piece. There's so many clips that we didn't show where he's adjusting the defense, both Mm -hmm. the line and the coverage units behind him. Um, So yeah, I think, I think week one is, potentially realistic but i think two to four is that sweet spot and you could see him um starting to make moves and starting to make plays all right so on we're gonna change gears a little bit we're gonna switch from the guys that just signed and get into some of the bears films some of the stuff from the bills offense and how the first stringers really i want to talk about how they fared versus the bears defense uh, because they had a bad taste in their mouth from the prior game against the steelers and i thought you know, when we talk about Dorsey and we talk about Josh Allen, the offensive line, some of the new weapons, I thought the offense looked really good. I thought they were stressing the quick game. The ball was out of Josh Allen's hands in like 2.5 seconds. It was crisp. It was very snappy. It had tempo. It had purpose. It had a, a different feeling uh, from that starting offense this, uh, this week uh, versus the prior week. And the thing I really liked, Ant, was – the quick game, and but specifically the quick game, which we're going to watch some film on, the manufactured touches, the ability to throw it shorter, you know, and get some yak yards after that. Some of the screens, whether they're mm. swing screens, uh, whether they're little escape screens, uh, which the Cook one was called back, but I, know. I like where their head was at. And I like the balance from run to pass. I like the balance when you're talking running style, Cook to Harris. Like there were some cool 
balance when we're talking about the Bills starting offense against the Bears. Yeah, you know, you had a little uh, either a smoke or a tunnel screen to Hardy. You had uh, the quick, quick, uh, quick little swing uh, screen action to Cook early on. And then, yeah, you mentioned the bigger like escape screen. I popped hard on the couch. I was like, oh, a screen for like 20 yards. And then yeah. it got called back because the Edwards block in the back. Yeah, I, I liked it. And, you know, I think what was a little unfortunate was – you know, there were some errant throws by Kyle sure. Allen that kind of threw things off. But to your point, the rhythm, I think the timing of things, the design, like I was pleasantly surprised with what we saw um, in that game uh, against the Bears. And uh, especially, I talked about it on the post game on Saturday, continuing to see more success in the ground game, not mm -hmm. just from James Cook himself, but from the offensive line. Like Cook saw success. Harris saw success. Darrington Evans saw some success granted he a big one he did all on his own by breaking 75 <laughs> tackles but yeah. continuing to see that rhythm in the run game we've seen success in the run game the Pittsburgh game was kind of a mess but a strong performance in the on the ground against Indianapolis a strong performance against the Bears here with a little more rhythm for the pass it was an encouraging performance from the group yeah and so we're going to take a look at some of these plays and what we're talking about here so this first play I mean I labeled it bread and butter because it really is you're going to watch Hardy in the slot to the bottom. Watch him diagnose the leverage. Little option out. I mean, this is a la Cole Beasley. Mm. Throw his money in between the corner and the slot defender who is trapping him. I, I mean, just the setup. Let's rewind it here. Look at the setup. Pre-snap. Where's the leverage of this defender? Mm -hmm. Kind of outside, maybe down the middle of Hardy, right? But watch him change right as the ball snap. These two guys change their stems. And what happens? He takes inside leverage. So Hardy says, okay, I'm going to attack that leverage. Mm -hmm but just to get to where I want to go. And he does that perfectly good timing. And once again, throttles down in that window, he doesn't carry it out here to get lit up. And the throw is on point from the left hash. And I love just it's minor and he doesn't get many yards after the catch, but you're going to see why he is that yak guy where he could get yards after the catch. Look at the adjustment by him. He's catching it and rotating immediately so that when he catches it, he can get upfield. Now, again, there's two defenders right there. But you see that bread and butter of the wide receiver, the slot wide receiver, being able to read the leverage on this play. You know, I think as as we've gotten, and I say we, like meaning you and I on the show, and even a lot of fans, like with the excitement of Dalton Kincaid and the positives for uh, Sherfield and some of the questions around Shakir, Hardy's been kind of like the forgotten guy. And he had a couple real quality reps against Pittsburgh where he was leaning into defenders and snapping off out routes and creating separation. And here, yeah, you see this nice little option route with, with the nuance to understand how to attack the leverage, throttle down. I also choose to believe that Allen puts this throw on his back shoulder on purpose so that way he doesn't mm -hmm. get lit up by the trap yep. outside from Jalen Johnson, which is a nice piece from Allen. And then, yeah, like I love – it's one of the things I've highlighted James Cook for this offseason is the way he's been finishing his runs. I like how hard he finishes this run. Like I don't care if it's only an extra yard or two. He gets it. He puts his head down. Head down. He, makes them take him down and it takes three dudes to stop his forward progress and drive him back and put him down to the ground. So nice, clean, technical, physical, and with some tenacity to it um, for a guy who I think has been not largely forgotten, but has kind of been, you know, put on the back burner for a lot of discussions this off season. And the same thing we talked about with Kincaid's film last week, they hammer this play to Hardy. They hammer this play to Kincaid, these option routes. And then when these guys start trapping again, Gabe Davis, we saw oh, it years ago. Yeah, you got that honey hole shot and that too high, too high look. So once again, they they keep doing this. They keep you know give the Bears and the defense give them these option routes, these slot routes, and they're completing them at a high rate. Eventually, you're gonna have that hole shot deep down the field. So on to the next play. This is a simple mesh concept, but I just love it from beginning to end. Empty set, James Cook out wide. Here's your indicator. Here's your man zone indicator. Well, a linebacker's out there on Cook. Well, guess what? Now you got man coverage. You see Josh call out who the mic is. That sets up the blocking, and you just get the mesh concept, and they're going to run digs on the under right here. Gabe Davis is going to run a little interference on Tremaine Edmonds, and that gives Josh Allen an easy pitch and catch to Stefan Diggs. And, and the reads, it's just money. It's it, the progressions through this mesh concept are the rail route right here. That's one. And then number two is digs coming from the top. That's two. And you see it. It's it's perfectly executed. Again, short yardage. I think Josh Allen's average depth of target this preseason has been seven. Mm. Keep in mind, he ended last year at 10.2. I was going to say at 75. <laughs> 
<laughs> like just so much attacking downfield at the end of the year last year. Um, I, I love this one too. Like, and again, I did think you hit it, you hammered it home. There's nothing too much to add. I just like, I like his read and progression in the call being on third down and in short yardage. Like he looks at cook, he sees the linebackers over the top on that, but he knows it's man coverage. So he knows Diggs is going to clear. And then he gets the protection to allow him to sit in the mm-hmm. pocket and wait and wait. There's the clear boom, drop it down, take the first down. There's no reason to try and push the ball. There's no reason to get any type of, or show any semblance of aggressiveness. Take the drag route, take the seven yard gain on third and three or third and four, keep it pushing. Um, Diggs actually has a little more space and is able to get up field a bit. And uh, yeah, nice to see that. I also, I, I think, oh, I didn't clip this one, but I saw this happen on the broadcast and immediately was like, all the Bills fans are going to be like, Tremaine Edmonds sucks. Look at him blow that <laughs> coverage. <laughs> oh, see, yeah. Pops even said it. And I heard Edmonds coverage is in the comments right there. But yeah, nice progression and read from Allen. Good call. Take what the defense gave you. This is real easy. Like this, we don't, you know, pitch and catch is a lot harder than it actually is, but this is right. nice just pitch and catch. And I also like the protection allowing him to get to it. Right. And so here's one of those manufactured plays. This is essentially a screen. So they move Hardy across the formation, a too high look. We always talk about the screen game and wish the bills would develop it. So, you know, especially cause they see so many too high looks. And so they get that too high look. They're trying to uncover whether it's man or zone. Uh, it ends up being zone here. And so they motion him. You got split flow. So the ball's being faked this way. So that's going to get, get the eyes going a certain direction. And then you're going to slide Hardy out here and watch the guys up top. They're not running routes. They're setting up the block. And so mm-hmm. the thing I love about this, Josh, normally he hangs on to, to this way too mm-hmm. long on these type mm-hmm. of slide routes. And especially if he's running it from under center and he's doing a little boot action, he gets it to Hardy immediately. Now, if you want to make fun of Edmonds, this is the play you want to make fun of him. So they get <laughs> the ball to Hardy quickly. And this is exactly what they're trying to do. They're splitting the defense and they're getting an advantage. So right now, Hardy and Edmonds, they're, they're neck and neck, so there's no leverage yet gained by Hardy. But watch Hardy get the ball and gain that leverage and, and get these guys thinking, okay, I'm going to the sideline, but then he puts on the brakes and cuts up inside. And Tremaine Edmonds, that's something we've always critiqued him for. When he's at full speed, he just doesn't have the ability to throw on the brakes and change direction because of his size and how big he is. Yep, That shows up here. The Bills knew that, and they use Hardy again. This was what a six or seven yard gain on a simple route that was manufactured by Ken Dorsey and the Bills offense and an extension of the run game. This is the type of stuff that we need to see this season. Same type of stuff that we saw early in the season against the Rams last year. Yeah. You know, the first quarter of the, the season, 2022 season. Yeah, just making it easy. This is this is kind of like, you know, you said an extension of the run game. This is like an easy button for Josh Allen. And you hit the big point for me, like Allen doesn't hold on to this ball. He doesn't try and, you know, take a couple extra steps. He lets the ball do the work and he lets Hardy do the work. He just gets mm-hmm. the ball to him right away. Get into your playmaker's hands and let him go make plays and do something for you. Hardy immediately gets that ball, pushes like he's going to the sideline, sets up that leverage, hits a couple chop steps, gets back inside. He's going to be a mismatch in the open field for most people, no matter how athletic or fluid mm-hmm. or big or or fast a defender is his footwork, his agility, his stop start ability is going to make him a problem in the open field. And that's why it's such a nice, easy button for Allen. And I'm glad he recognized it. Just dump it down into his hands and let him go create for you and take the yards after catch. Yeah, no doubt, man. It's just, uh, again, they're using little things. Those are just a little things. Make it easy. Get the ball out of Josh's hands. Let it, you know, get into the hands of the weapons. And here's another play. This one from the end zone angle. This time the James cook, We've talked about his patience, uh, you know, this preseason and how he's been slashing in and out of uh, blocks and and cuts. Um, I really like this play from Torrance. Watch Mm -hmm. him punch the right guard right here. Again, near shoulder punches him over and makes that, you know, block from Brown so much easier. And then the timing, the climb, climb, then boom, as James Cook is on him, the timing is just on, uh, it's just on point. Look at him turn, absorb that that uh, play and, and a run fit from TJ Edwards. And then boom, James Cook is up the field. Again, I like the, the dichotomy between what Damian Harris did with, you know, the fullback in there with the quarterback under center mm-hmm. versus what James Cook can do with his slashing style from the spread offense looks uh, against the Bears. Yeah, the, and the slashing style with his burst is so important because if there's any type of space, whether it's a light box or a seven-man box – 
his burst and his slashing ability allows him to eat up that space so quickly. Before you know it, he's already got like two, three mm-hmm. yards. And then if you miss a tackle or if the blocking is sound, those two, three yards turn into four to six yards or even bigger. And yeah, you hit it with the, with the Torrance piece. Like, I think this one's a good example of highlighting, you know, we've talked so much about how big his hands are, how strong his hands are. Once he latches on to Edwards, it's literally like that vice grip. He latches on and it's, it's almost instantaneous. Like there's the latch. And as soon as he latches, it's, it's such a seamless, okay, cool. Let me latch and then turn you away from the hole. Yeah. to create that alley and create that lane. And yeah, look at, look, he's got he Edwards. <laughs> yeah. He's got Edwards off kilter. Like he's being lifted off of his inside leg. Watch his right leg guys. Watch yeah. his right foot. <laughs> he looks like a dog, like shaking it out after like they finished peeing on like the front <laughs> lawn. Like that's what he just, the instantaneous strength and power, but also the ability to transition that the seamless. What about Mitch Morse? What oh, about bro. Mitch Morse? So Mitch Morse, I like, so that's the other highlight too. Like the Mitch Morse piece, Gets on Pickens, whose tape I like, and just watch, yeah. watch. <laughs> I don't even like, there's nothing you really like say with it. Just like, look at the strength and the power and the leverage from that inside arm. Not doing anything with his left. He's mm-hmm. got his torque. hand right on that jersey. Yeah, and look at the torque. So you'll see that and think, oh, wow, that's some good upper body strength. That's good core strength. You need mm-hmm. that everywhere right from there. Exactly. From your abs and in your gut and in your obliques, right into your hips, your adductors and your adductors, like just to be able to turn him. It's such a real pretty, if you pause it right there, like look at as, as Morse turns him, look at that alley for James Cook. It's nice and clean. It's nice and succinct. And then even David Edwards, um, believe he wants to climb to the second level here to get Sanborn, but Sanborn kind of old pursues it a little and kind of flows too much. So then Edwards is like, okay, cool. Let me just help Dawkins right. clean up the first level a little bit. Um, solid gain for cook. But again, like this is, this is so easy for your running back. Like you, I don't want to make the comment, but like you could put you and I in there and we'd probably churn out six or seven yards with how well blocked that was, especially on the interior. Yeah. Just, I uh, wanted to highlight some of the blocking up the middle and we've seen the bills almost make a concerted effort about running up the middle, regardless if it's from under center or from shotgun and more of that James downhill Cook, presence. Yeah. James Cook has done a great job of, you know, staying between the tackles, not wanting to bounce it outside uh, when it came to the run game in between the tackles and even, even tighter inside when we're talking a, a gap runs, B gap runs. Mm-hmm. So this play is uh, Josh Allen being Josh Allen, one step drop. He feels that pressure up the middle and then does what every quarterback shouldn't do except for Josh Allen, uh, throw back <laughs> across the field on this play to Gabe Davis. But uh, I wanted to highlight this play because it's a, it's a damn good play from him. But how the defense did trick him initially. Initially, you see that to a high look, uh, and you see them drop down into a single high. Uh, essentially, it looks like cover three. You see the safety kind of drop down into this area right here. Um, so Josh is looking to the two high beater side, the smash concept down here, right? Um, so he looks down there. It's a one-step drop. He's thinking he's going to get rid of the ball, likely to Kincaid on this, but it's covered really well, so he doesn't throw it. And again, one-step drops, you're trying to, as a quarterback, offensive line, you're trying to mesh this, the drop and the route combination to what type of set an offensive lineman is is seeing here. And the mm-hmm. line gets pushed back into Josh Allen's face as he now goes to the other side where his eyes should take him because it's a single high coverage look. But the pressure's in his face, and he escapes the pocket and is able to still complete it to Gabe Davis to get them into the low red zone. Uh, Gabe Davis, Mr. Captain now too, man. Mm. Captain for the Buffalo Bills this year. Congrats to him and some of the other guys that were elected captains today. But uh, just good stuff from Josh Allen. And it just shows you how, hey, sometimes a quarterback's going to be fooled, but Josh has that ability to play above the scheme. Yeah, that ability to, you know, we say it all the time, and you say it all the time, the ability to play above the scheme, um, the ability to, you know, even when a, a defense is right, to make them wrong, and that's what he does on this one. Like, there's some good pressure um, that the pocket collapses. You know, the the depth in that interior of the pocket is um, is vulnerable, and then Brown gives up a little bit on the outside, so Allen escapes out the front door, and, you know, exactly just how you draw it up. This is teach tape right here for a quarterback <laughs> roll out to your right and throw back across your body to the middle of the field. Um, also nice job for, again, you know, this is somewhat basic, but nice job by Gabe Davis too, like working back and yeah. locking, you know, being able to find himself in the field of vision of Josh Allen, making himself available. I mean, they run these drills in practice and then between that and playing with each other for so long, you're going to have that feel for, 
what your quarterback wants you to do in these type of scenarios. And it also helps knowing that Josh never wants to let a play die. Like he doesn't want to run yeah. out of bounds or throw it out of bounds. Gabe keeps working, gets himself uh, into a really advantageous spot. And it was a first down. Right. And so on to our first sponsored segment. This segment is sponsored by easy loan auto sales. And we call this our making it look easy segment here. And Kyle Allen under center quarterback for the bills. And Quentin Morris, tight end, in line, running that Dino post down the seam for the touchdown. Mm -hmm. An amazing throw and catch by the Bills offense here. 21 personnel, so two running backs with Gilliam and Evans in there, two wide receivers, one tight end. And I love the route from Morris here. He, mm -hmm. he sticks outside, gets that corner, and this is a corner playing over the top of him. Sticks him outside and then works back to the seam. And this touch throw mm -hmm. up and over, the cornerback who was a really long cornerback and, and into the hands of Morris was just, it was pretty. And that's why we're, we're calling this segment, uh, the making it look easy throw and catch of the game. That's uh, Kyle Allen to Quentin Morris of the Buffalo bills. Yes. Sponsored of course, by easy loan auto sales, regardless of your credit situation, easy loan can help you get behind the wheel and on the road to better credit. All their vehicles include a two year, 24,000 mile warranty, and they have three convenient locations in Buffalo Lockport and Niagara falls. They can get you driving today. Go to easy to start your accelerated approval. Yeah. And Eric, this one, this one was really pretty, especially because Allen had, you know, we had talked about a Kyle Allen had missed some throws earlier in the game. And then he just drops this real pretty one right to Morris who almost kind of catches it like with his pinkies or like the outside part of his hands. It almost looked like it was going to fall through. Um, but I, I love your point where, you know, Morris puts this move on a corner, you know, Tyreek Stevenson, granted he is a rookie uh, from the university of Miami. Shout out to the U Your but Tyreek Stevenson. Yeah, he is. Um, I had higher <laughs> hopes for him at Miami, but Miami turned into a dumpster fire last year again, but that's a conversation for another time. Tyreek had, you know, Tyreek had a good week at the senior bowl senior when we bowl, were down yeah. there. Yep. And that really helped propel him up some draft boards and he's had a good camp. He's had a good preseason. He had an interception earlier in this game off of Kyle mm -hmm. Allen. And it's nice to see Morris who it looks like Morris put on more weight this off season. Like he looks a little thicker and a little heavier on the frame, not saying he's out of shape, but just that he tried to bulk up, maybe trying mm -hmm. to embrace more of a, a blocking aspect to his game. But when you see him out in space, even though he, he has bulked up a bit, you can still see that he's got that, you know, that wide receiver skill, skill set still embedded yeah. in, in him from his previous life. And it's nice to see him press and attack that leverage from Stevenson, lean into him, and then just be able to put that foot in the ground and get vertical and get skinny. And then what we've also got on this play, and I tweeted this out um, during the game, we saw it a couple times in this. So mm -hmm. this formation bringing one of the safeties down into the box. Eric, this is what we've talked about. Some of the benefit that you could have from 12 personnel, you could also have it from 21, 22, all these pieces. Having and not only being in those personnel groupings, but being in more of a heavier or more traditional heavy alignment. So you've got right. that offset eye with Gilliam in the backfield. You've got your two receivers to the bottom, and then you've just got Morris as the only receiving option up top. The Bills have been successful running the ball up to this point in time in the game. So between the success on the ground, then the personnel and the formational alignment, the Bears bring a safety down because mm -hmm. they got to honor that run threat and you got to honor the personnel and the alignment. And so with the Bears in that single high, where one of the areas you're vulnerable when you're in single high coverage is up those seams. And that's yeah. where you get that space for Quentin Morris in between that post safety and that deep third corner. And you highlighted Hardy on the bottom. If right. that post safety who you circled right there, he's playing this to Deontay Hardy a little bit. And Kyle Allen, you highlighted it there too. He starts to eyeball that safety and looks to the left. So what does that post safety start to do? He cheats just mm. a little bit towards Deontay Hardy, who's threatening that bottom seam. He does that. Allen goes back to that up seam, that top seam route to Quentin Morris, and that's where you had that completion. So not only a good throw and a good ball and a good route, but a, a play that resulted from a formational dictation advantage based on the success that they had earlier and then the personnel and alignment. And this is, Eric, this is what we've talked about for a while of the ability to take defenses out of these two high coverage structures, put them into single high looks, whether it's cover one or cover three, and to be able to attack them where they're vulnerable. We saw it earlier too on a uh, 
on a deep cross to Trent Sherfield against uh, cover three. So oh, those yeah. single high looks, especially cover three, they're vulnerable on the seams and on those deep overs or crossers. And this is an example of that here. Right. Formations and personnel can dictate things. They can dictate coverages by bringing that safety down and having to defend an extra gap, whether they're running it or not. And you have to bring that safety down and that can give you those single high coverages, specifically cover three. As you said, the weakness in cover three is up the seams. They executed it perfectly. Kyle mm -hmm. Allen executed it perfectly. That's why we are calling this touchdown to Quentin Morris, the easy loan auto sales, making it look easy play of the game for uh, the Buffalo Bills offense and Kyle Allen. Just good, good stuff from those guys. Again, not crazy complex stuff, mm -hmm. but executing at a high level on a concept that every team runs. Every team runs it. Every team sees this type of coverage. Uh, so very, very good work. Uh, between those two guys and, and the offense all together. So uh, on to the next segment here. This one's presented by Nickel City. This is uh, – we, we love having Nickel City back <laughs> on board with us. Uh, they're, uh, you know, downtown Buffalo, uh, a great boutique, a cigar place. Uh, we're calling this the light-up segment. So Nickel City Cigars light-up segment. And this play, <laughs> it was a hell of a run. This is Evans's run. I call it, it was like a Marshawn Lynch type run. Yeah, I mean, beast, it was that, beast quake. Yeah, for sure, man. Like he, and, and unfortunately he's not on the roster anymore, but we're still yeah. going to give him props as that light up play of the game when we're talking the run game here. That little juke right here Oof. as he gets through the gap as 45 lines him up, filthy. And then right here too, good good job of covering up two hands on the ball. That guy slides off to him and then just the want and will to finish this play for the touchdown. Great run by Evans on this play. Him putting that leg in the ground after he gets through the hole and just shaking that safety, uh, number 45 coming from depth. Yeah, absolutely filthy. Like almost like a dead leg right there. Like gets through and just bong, puts it. Look at the lean, bursts mm -hmm. through, creates an arm tackle situation, runs through it, and like you said, feels that defender covers up the ball. This is the part that gets me like 25 goes to tackle him. I, I don't get how their feet didn't get tangled. And I don't know if right. this was fate or like destiny or Evans literally felt like, cause you can see him like, look at, he steps over. Like over. he makes a conscious decision to lift his right leg to try and step over the trash, like falling on the ground. Like he doesn't want to get caught up on a shoulder pad or legs or anything. And he stays clean trips up a little bit on the legs of 22, but keeps it going, smells the goal line, gets across there. Just this was really like a beautiful run and, and you know, understandable that it's preseason, um, yeah. but man, just what a quality run from Evans and shout out to the blocking scheme, you know, creating that right. hole for him at the first level, you know, nice double team block there and then climbing up to the second level to grab 44. Nice job by Alec Anderson creates mm -hmm. that space. And again, makes it somewhat easy for Evans to know where the hole is, but Evans paces it right out of the backfield. He lets the scheme develop, gets through the hole, and then makes a dude miss, breaks three tackles, and houses it. Just a tremendous play uh, from Darrington Evans for our Nickel City Cigars light-up play of the game. And as Eric said, Nickel City Cigars located in downtown Buffalo on 284 Franklin Street. They are a new school boutique cigar experience. They got a modern lounge. Vintage arcade games, multiple TVs, bourbon, cigars, local Buffalo craft beers, a full members bar. Uh, Victory cigars are always on Nickel City. And use the discount code COVER1, that's COVER, and the number one, no spaces, uh, for 20% off your entire order at NickelCityCigars.com. And when you order online, you can pick up in-store or have your order shipped to your door. All right. That's awesome, awesome run by Evans. And uh, like you said, good blocking up front. And from a guy, number 70, Alec Anderson, who made the roster this year. Um, mm -hmm. And he's going to be our next segment. He's a guy that I want to talk about a little bit because um, he was kind of on the fringe. He was a guy that we weren't sure if he was going to make the actual roster. And um, we were happy to break the news that he did make the roster last, uh, last yesterday afternoon. And I like his versatility, right? I mean, this preseason, mm -hmm. he's played center. He's played guard. He's played tackle. I like, I always come back to Cromerisms. His hands, quick, <laughs> accurate hands, whether he's, especially when he's inside at center and guard, I, I will agree with you. I, I'm not the biggest fan of him as a tackle. Um, I, I don't think he is a tackle. I think he's an interior offensive line guy. I think he is what Ryan Bates is right now. And I mm -hmm. think he can even develop to be on the same level as Ryan Bates. 
Um, I had to look up when I watched his film. I'll let some of it roll. I had to look up whether he was a prior wrestler because some of his body positioning and some of mm. these plays this preseason, not just in this game, he just understood his body positioning, his leverage, and where his body needed to be. And he felt when a defensive tackle was kind of moving in a different direction, trying to track the ball, mm. and he would put his body in between the mm -hmm. you know the running back and, or the quarterback for that matter. You saw that time and time again. And I think his play, his role will be super important as we are in kind of like a wait and see mode when it comes to Connor McGovern yeah. um, with his injury. Um, because I, I obviously uh, David Edwards, who we've raved about this preseason, mm -hmm. I think he is, you know, the backup to mm -hmm. McGovern. If McGovern can't play in week one, I don't expect him to play in week one. I think it's be very close based on the injury that he has. I think yeah. it'll be very close for him when it comes to playing in week one. They usually takes a, a few weeks. Uh, to heal from that injury. Um, but I think Alec Anderson adds a little little more versatility uh, inside when we're talking about mm. um, playing both center and guard. He looked phenomenal at both center and guard mm -hmm. in the preseason. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and, you know, I like that they tried him out at tackle just to see how far they can push that versatility. Um, and he was good at, at, at the tackle spot from a run blocking perspective, had some, you know, ups and significant downs in pass pro. And, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Um, I like him at center and guard. And we saw it right from the jump in that Colts game, the physicality, the awareness, the right. high functional football IQ, like the, the, the tenacity, like even here, like he's sitting there, he's, he's squatting there at center. Like he's calling out, he's communicating like pressure and who's ID and who, and being able to being able to do that piece is such a huge part of Mitch Morse's game. And then as that play develops, Eric, like you showed, you see that slot pressure coming, you know, right. you can't see it off that end zone angle, but he's calling it out from the jump. And that's why mm -hmm. Ryan Vandermark at left tackle is able to kind of, he drops in a set, but he's immediately looking because Anderson called it out and I did it from the get go. That's a huge piece to have somebody who can give you that versatility on the interior physically, but also mentally to have the football IQ to go along with the physical ability. Yeah. It's a really nice depth piece. And we've, we've, you know, praised Ryan Bates all off season for his versatility and how nice it is to have a guy who is legitimately functional at center and at guard. And it looks like the bills have another guy like that on their hands um, in Alec Anderson. And I love the body position piece that you, you put out there, especially against the run. Like he just has that ability to, whether he's torquing his body or turning, using his hands, using his right. arms, using his core, like he just understands leverage, like and the ability to stay in between his man and, and leverage that space and really happy that he made the team and, and he deserved it for the strong preseason that he had. Right, and we're getting some comments that McGovern practiced today and that Bean said it's minor. Yes, that's all true. And if you watch some of the footage, he did not look like he was healthy, guys. I'm sorry. He did not look healthy. And based on what I've been told, it's it's not just a minor injury. It's more of a, a, a wait and see. It's, hey, we need to monitor this day by day, week by week. But given the injury that I've been told, it's not something – it's basically right on the fringe of week one that he would be generally, ideally ready. And I'm sorry, if he's at 80%, <laughs> I'm not putting him out there against Quinn and Williams. Bro, and yeah, that not against that defensive front. line. No. And especially when you, if you guys go back and watch our breakdown on Connor McGovern and what we stressed as his number one strength mm. is his ability to anchor. If he can't do that because of the injury he has to his knee, I don't want him in there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would rather take David Edwards because I, I trust him. I do yeah. trust David Edwards, not to the level of Connor McGovern, but I'm sorry. So, yes, I agree. I saw the footage. I've heard I've heard the coach say that, hey, it's minor. But based on what I'm told and what I, you know, what I've seen, I don't I think it'll be very I'd be shocked if he plays week mm -hmm. one. And honestly, again, if he's 80 or 90 percent, I still probably wouldn't roll him out there when you have the type of depth that we've been touting this entire preseason at the interior offensive line position. I don't want him out there against the Jets in week one if he's 80 or 90%. If he's 100% and he doesn't have to wear a brace, fine. Yeah. I don't. He's not going to be. I'm sorry, guys. He's not going to be. No, and you're not risking a, a starting offensive lineman or anybody in week one. Like, it's a long season. I'm not risking somebody's health in September, especially against a quality opponent. And again, Eric, your point, part of that is tied into – 
the fact that you've got legitimately competent depth in David Edwards behind him. This is a dude right. who has experience in Cromer's system, who's looked good in camp and looked good this preseason. Like we we ID David Edwards as being a guy to, before Connor McGovern came in, we tabbed him as a guy we'd like to see come in and just yep. be the regular starter at left guard for this build. He's looked good. Yeah, he has. So having him be the backup and the depth guy that that's part of the reason you have a player like that, because if one of your starters is banged up, you can let him rest up and get on the mend a little bit more and get to a hundred percent, knowing that you've got competence behind them to be able to put in their place. Right. And so let's, let's get through some of these Anderson clips that he's at right guard here. Talk about hands. We talk about technique. You see them on this zone block. He is feeding with that punch. You see the punch to that near shoulder of that yeah. defensive tackle that allows Vandemark to get his hips around and get that body positioning. Like, that's what I'm saying. Quick, accurate hands. Mm -hmm. He hits him and knocks him over to Vandermark, moves to the next level. Hands, hands, hands. Here's mm -hmm. a pass pro rep, wide alignment, two-handed punch, confident in that two-handed punch. You see that defender fall back, and then mm -hmm. boom, that guy comes with that long arm immediately. He's ready for it. Boom, smacks it down, engages, finishes, <sighs> balls in the air for a touchdown. And talk about this play. And, and really, again, what encompasses why Cromer – reportedly loves Anderson. I mean, it's got to be the hands, right? It's got to be the hands. 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 <laughs> we make that joke all the time ever. And it, for those who it's don't easy. know, you know, we, we showed um, some pieces from an Aaron Cromer coaching clinic uh, last year when he came back to the Buffalo bills. And yeah, one of the pieces he talked about, he's all about hands, like hand placement, hand strength, active hands. And you see it all just set up on that play. And it, Eric, like you said, it starts with that initial pop, like that two handed punch. Look at the, just, it completely stalls mm -hmm. that defensive lineman. Like 99 is immediately like, oh, like there's some shock and some pop in those hands. And so then 99 tries to transition to that long arm and immediately chops that wrist, takes his momentum. And <laughs> look at look how hard he chops that wrist and how much how much lean that 99 had on that arm because when Anderson chops it, 99 basically falls all over himself and basically falls into Anderson. But instead of just gently and calmly putting him down to the ground, he just <laughs> chucks him down. And that's that finish. That's that physicality. That's that bite. We've seen more and maybe it, it, it comes hand in hand with more of a downhill running presence, but we've seen more physicality and more nastiness from the bills, offensive line, first teamers, second teamers, third teamers this preseason. And Alec Anderson has been one of the highlights of that piece from a physicality perspective. But what's nice on this one, Eric, like we said, it's not just the physicality, it's the technique that goes along with it. He's sound fundamentally and he's sound with his technique on this one, especially for someone like Aaron Cromer, who loves the type of skill set that Anderson has. Right. And we, you talked about it when we were, you know, talking about his strengths and kind of weaknesses at the beginning on this play, he's at center and he's immediately calling out that they're going to send a blitz off the edge. And that's exactly what happens and why it's important because when he communicates that out there, now they have that left side locked down one, two, and then you're going to see Vandermark go ahead and get out on that slot defender coming off the edge. But I, again, it comes back to the hands, watch him stab after, after snapping it, stabs with his left. And what does that do? That deter It deters the pass rusher from hitting that A-gap. So he punches out. He deters that initial uh, punch or that initial rush from that mm -hmm. nose tackle. And then that guy, it funnels right down the cylinder. It funnels him right down the middle. And now he's able to engage with the right hand. Look, Watch the left. And then here comes the right. Oh, he's mm -hmm. coming back inside. Look, now he's locked in right. Perfect hand placement. Right mm -hmm. where he needs to be. Lands at right. Lands the left. And then that guy is locked down. And again, the body positioning, finishing near the line of scrimmage, just another good rep. But it starts with his quickness. It starts with his hands. And he's able to lock the lock the pass rusher down near the line of scrimmage. Look how square he is when he initially, like the, the placement, like he's got a good base with his feet and his hips. He's got the hand placement. And as the rest of that play goes through, he is in complete control with the hand strength. He's got his hands right into that chest of his man. He gets outside a little bit initially there with the right, but then turns Torx brings that left hand into the chest. There is nowhere to go. There is no momentum or drive for this defensive lineman. Look at, look at that positioning in the posture. You highlighted mm -hmm. the head and the neck mm -hmm. and the arm placement. And then again, all the way down to the hips, the feet, he's almost got the, the duck feet going on there. Like yep. he is just completely anchored in and set. And there is nowhere for that man to go. Like, look at like that Steelers defender is literally trying to like peek over the shoulder, just trying to like see what's going on <laughs> because he can't get through. Like there's nowhere to go. And it started 
with a quality rep mentally and it ended with a quality rep physically and fundamentally. And talk about quality rep, another clip from the Steelers game. Uh, and I talked about his positioning and his ability to, to feel and sense when that defender wants to come back to where the ball is and come this way, right? And so he's able to sense that. And as that guy tries arming over and ripping back into the other gap, you see him wall that guy off for the touchdown for Mims. I just love how he felt the defensive tackle, you know, switching his leverage and trying to get back into the gap where the ball was going. And he uses his body and body position to seal that guy off for the touchdown. Just good stuff by Alec Anderson on this play as he's at right guard. Yeah, this one was beautiful. Like I remember when I saw it initially, I was watching, I forget what I was watching for on this play, but I saw Anderson on the ground, like at the end of it. And I was like, Oh, what Mm -hmm. happened? And I was like tracing it back and yeah, just the adjustment. And again, the core strength, that it takes to be able to like, he's look at that position, like the lean, like Anderson isn't in like great position to be able to take his man and turn him the other way, even though 96 is trying to get into that gap and kind of helps him a little bit by doing so. But the, the, the flexibility and the core strength to be able to pivot and turn your body to then turn a very large grown man on the defensive line, that's a nice, again, another physical aspect to his game. And to be able to see that from a guy who, I don't know, Eric, realistically is probably like third string on your depth chart. Like that's a really nice quality piece to have. And again, a guy who can do it at center and guard. Yeah. I, I just, I like his film and uh, you know, keep an eye out. We're going to try to get him in the film room here in a, in a few weeks or at least during the season uh, to kind of look at what, you know, he, he can bring and, um, I feel like he's going to be another one of those base guys, right? Where mm-hmm. um, we're going to be super surprised at the football IQ uh, when we start talking to him and about offensive line play and techniques. Just from me talking with him behind the scenes, I feel like he's going to wow some people if we uh, break down some film with him. So, mm-hmm. Anthony, we're going to quickly shift gears. We're getting behind. We're an hour and 16 minutes in. We appreciate everyone joining us. Smash that like button. Make sure you're subscribed to the Cover One YouTube channel and leave us a comment afterwards about your favorite part or what you want us to focus on going forward in the film room each and every week. And so I wanted to start off uh, this next segment uh, sponsored by Jonathan Miller, um, uh, our real estate guy. He's a a guy located in Western New York, and we're going to call this the Real Estate Rewind. And we're going to have several cuts of a guy who I thought, Anthony, stood out a bunch this preseason and in, in ways that he really hadn't in prior years. And that's Saran Neal. You know, we talked about um, the different types of guys that, um, you know, have improved their games and, you know, have, uh, you know, elevated and developed. Look at the speed and versatility Mm -hmm. by Saran Neal on this play against the Steelers here. Look at that speed coming all the way across the field on this little jet sweep. I mean, I don't think we talk about his athleticism enough. I know Jordan Poyer years ago when we did an interview with him, he said, he told Saran Neal, hey, just play fast. You're the most athletic guy on this defense. And you are you can just play fast and just let it rip. You're going to make plays. And he makes plays and made plays all preseason, Ant. Yeah, you know, somebody who is, you know, lauded for his special teams play. You know, we talk about it on the show. Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean talk about it regularly. But he had, you know, starting from that Colts game through the Pittsburgh game, through the Chicago game, regular plays on the ball, both in terms of making plays on the ball in coverage, but also like that first play you showed there on that jet sweep, like plays against the run. Like you saw his athleticism flash. You saw his uh, football IQ flash. And then Mm -hmm. especially these plays, like this one was really nice. Like to close down in space, that quick trigger, to see what's going on, to see that flat route develop and understand what his responsibility is. You know, number one is going in. So number two is going out flows right over the top closes down quickly. Like as soon as 45 makes that catch, he tries to turn up field and bang Neil is right there. And then you get a nice sound tackle um, Mm -hmm. on the ball carrier for a gain of about one or two. And he was making, he was all over the field. Like dude was buzzing and bursting all over the field. It seemed like every single preseason game. Yeah, and he made five pass breakups this preseason. That's something that, you know, he hadn't done in prior years. And he he did a great job of understanding leverage and and using the sidelines and and turning his head when it came to ball dropping in. You see the slot fade here. He was tested on a few slot fades this uh, preseason, and he stood the test here. It's right on the fringe of the red zone, all by himself, single high safety. 
again, plays the high shoulder, plays the high side here. And as that guy looks up, he gets chest to chest. And he makes a play at the catch point. Again, they tried him. You know, Several teams tried him from the slot fade position. Here he is again, top of the screen, slot, different leverage though. He plays outside leverage. He plays outside leverage because they're playing cover one. They got a post safety. So he's essentially kind of funneling him up to the middle of the field. But you're going to see that wide receiver break out. And once again, plays that perfectly in the end zone, help him break up at the catch point. This is something that we haven't seen from Saran Neal. And so I want to give him props with this, this segment because he's not talked about enough when we're talking versatility. He played a lot in the slot this preseason and held his own versus some really good wide receivers. Yeah, he, I, I mean, him and Jamarcus Ingram were like the, the heavy majority of the slot reps um, this, uh, this preseason. And yeah, Neal held his own. Like in the first clip, um, in coverage on that slot fade against the Bears. He's against Darnell Mooney, who yeah. is a legitimate like wide receiver too in the NFL. This time, like you said, he's playing it with inside leverage. You see the patience. Look at I like it. I love his head and his mm -hmm. eyes. Like right on the snap, he's watching those hips. He's not yep. fooled by the footwork. He's not fooled by the gear change or the pace change from Mooney. And he sees Mooney get upfield and he knows based on where Mooney is in the stem, okay. This thing is going vertical. I'm going to get on my horse. And then you see the speed runs to match it. it. Yes, run. Yeah. Because Neil's got that speed. Like, it, it's legitimate. Like, his straight line speed, he's at, he's athletic in a variety of ways, but he's got that speed, gets his head turned around, makes a play. This time, he's against a dude who is, I don't want to say prime for a breakout year, but Alec Pierce was a prospect I really like coming out of Cincinnati mm -hmm. last year. Had a fun rookie year. Had some plays in this one. Neil is stride for stride with him in phase. Pierce even tries to push off a little bit as he turns and he bends this route, but Neil stays right with him and is eventually able to make a play on the ball. Just and looking it, up at it too, man. Yes, he tracks it the whole way. And this, I honestly feel bad for Anthony Richardson on this one. Like this was a dime. Like this is really right. great coverage. And Richardson dropped it right into the bread basket. Like Pierce still probably should have come up with it, but he didn't. Because Neil was right on him, gets that hand over the top, punches through, rips through the arms, affects the vision and the hand-eye coordination, and then the ability to actually bring the ball in. Like it Neil makes him feel it too at the end, right? Like that's over. something John Butler talked about in a clinic I watched with him. Hey, whether he catches it or not, make him feel your, you know, that power of you coming down on top of him. That can weigh on wide receivers, and he does that here. Yes, Tr um, Tredavious White said it as well. I remember. Um, I forget who he was sitting down with, but he was he was breaking down the um the pass breakup against Odell Beckham when the Bills played the oh, Browns yeah, in like 2019. Back, yeah. yeah, and he's saying like, oh, I fall down on top of him because I want him to feel me. I want that physical presence. And Neil right. does it like that was just a great PBU again on the similar routes, but ran in different ways. His coverage and alignment and leverage was a little different, but both strong finishes at the catch point. Right, and so you saw how they challenged him from the slot down the field on those slot fades. This time, low red zone, outside corners. Look at them. They're playing with inside leverage, and they're basically telling the slot defender, hey, you're all by yourself. And so what the Steelers are trying to do is attack outside here. Neil is playing with inside leverage. That guy initially separates, but then watch the closing speed and play at the catch point by Neil. Just phenomenal stuff from him. And this, again, this is not a comfortable position for any corner, let alone a guy like him that is more of a, safety corner linebacker hybrid. This is incredible athleticism and recovery speed from Neil on this play against a guy that's more of a shifty jitterbug type wide receiver. Yeah. That's a situation that can suck in a hurry. Like you're on an Island in the slot against a guy who has a two way go who's shifty and sudden and decisive. And I, when I, when I was first watching the tape after this game happened, my thought was, uh, eh, this play only happened because Trubisky was like late on the throw. And then I watched it. I was like, no, he really wasn't like nope. Neil just closes this down really quickly. Like you see him go for that grab. And I like that he closes it down with the speed, but also Eric watch the angle, angle. that he takes. He, and the, the goal line really helps illustrate it. Cause it's got that plane for you. Instead of going straight across that goal line, Eric, like you highlighted, he takes that angle. So that way he can kind of undercut it, but not to the point where the ball can get over him, but he almost makes a beeline straight line angle right to the ball. So we can undercut and get to it for the pass breakup. That's a nice play overall, but especially in the moment on the goal line. Like you've got that guy with that two way go. He breaks out. You don't panic. Mm -hmm. You don't get grabby. You don't take a poor angle. You take the most efficient and direct angle possible. That was a tremendous play.
Right, and here's another one. This time, not in man coverage. You see him in zone. Here he is down to the bottom of the screen, drops out to his area. The threats in his area kind of vacate, and he gets his eyes on the quarterback, plays with those zone eyes. It's kind of a half roll from Mason Rudolph. Okay, who's coming into my area? And watch him read this. And in many ways, he baited this throw mm -hmm. to that wide receiver. He waits, waits, see him planting, but he's not jumping it right away. He's letting Rudolph start that delivery, and then guess what? Pounces on it for the pass breakup. Very good zone awareness on this play. Zone discipline, zone eyes. Like this is really good work. Again, showing that that uh, versatility. Man the zone and, and going against different types of guys, different types of quarterbacks, different types of wide receivers, and just really good read and play on the ball here from Serenio. Yeah, like these plays are all variety. You know, two slot fades. Um, you know, with a lot of green behind you, and then the play down in the low red zone, and then this one now. Yeah, the zone coverage piece. The the baiting action is awesome. Like you can literally see him. Once he stops, you can see him kind of slow playing it and kind of pitter pattering those feet. Like he's waiting, he's waiting, and then bang, so he can pounce mm -hmm. on it because he doesn't want to jump it too early because he doesn't want the quarterback to see that flash of color and then think like, uh oh, like maybe let me put the ball somewhere else, let me dirt it, throw it away, keep it, whatever. Like he baits this and plays this perfectly, jumps it again. Another aspect to his game, you saw the athleticism, you saw the physicality in these other clips. Now we show some of that football IQ piece. And those really good zone eyes, which is an underrated aspect. And Pops, yeah, with a really fun comment here saying, you know, Johnson, Neil, and Rap are uh, going to be special in nickel. Eric, what's nice about that is, you know, Taron Johnson, I think, is one of the most underrated players on this Bills defense and one of the most underrated players in the league. But yeah. it's a nice, yeah, nickel package that you could potentially have given the skill sets of Taron Johnson, Saran Neal, um, and Taylor Rapp because they're all different sizes, frames, and skill sets that allows you to play with different matchup and chess pieces if you're Sean McDermott. Yeah, I mean, the Bills all of a sudden went from, hey, can they do they have a guy that can play big nickel? Because Saran Neal hadn't really developed when it came to the coverage perspective mm -hmm. uh, uh, with when it, those responsibilities. Now it's almost a surplus because they have rap, you know, Hamlin's back. They have rap. They have Saran Neal playing like mm -hmm. this. I mean, watch his play. He's an off coverage, outside leverage on this play. And look at him out of structure. He connects to Mooney again. You see the quarterback extend and then boom, mm -hmm. pass breakup on the back end again. Totally different, you know, set of coverages the last two plays. And out in space, a lot of green. You've seen some of that shuffle. That save and shuffle and eyes, you know, on the quarterback, not necessarily just manning up. You're seeing some different things from Saran. You know, I was, I've just been impressed with him when it comes to his coverage skills. And, you know, he's been more than willing to stack in the A gap or B gap and, and stop the run. Mm -hmm. um, will he miss some tackles? Yes, he's missed for this preseason. So he will play fast and miss some tackles at times. But again, the Bills like that, you know, when it comes to being aggressive and opportunistic, they want that from, when he's on the field or when Taron Johnson is in that a gap, they want them to shoot the gap and not get covered up. So I've just been impressed with his game this preseason, which is why I wanted to highlight him once again on this past breakup. Yeah, this one's really nice. And Eric, I think it's a nice, it's a nice piece. Again, like you said, like it, it's another different example of how he's been succeeding this preseason. It's not like we're just showing him, you know, he what like here's 10 plays of him blitzing from the slot. Watch how successful right. he is. No, there are, there are a variety of coverages and a variety of looks against a variety of skill sets and players. I love how he, uh, you know, this is him um, doing what Kyrie Elam talked about with us when we had him in the film film room, you know, plastering to your man. And he does it in, I like how he gets physical, with Mooney here, Mooney tries to even like shake him and shed him Neither. off. And Neil is just like, nope, not going to happen. Like he's all over him. Physical has that good presence. And then again, you see the athleticism and the fluidity to get on the move with Mooney. And again, it's a good angle to the ball. It's fluid. It's athletic. He's got the, the hops to kind of get up there and generate the PBU at the end. Look like, how he immediately jumps in front of him. Yes. Like you said, once that guy throws him by, he immediately undercuts him and gets on the back hip, on that low hip to play the goal line. Um, and, and as you said, flattens out and gets underneath that wide receiver. Like he just, he's, he was, he's so reactive and he's so athletic that he's able to make plays like this. Yes. I, that's really what I love on this one. Like that ability to, again, get underneath taking that good angle. Cause even if you're reading this and you're plastering, if you get, if you get behind Mooney and he gets that positioning to the point that you can't make a play on the ball or you allow Mooney to kind of go back to the ball and make a play because you can't get in between him and the quarterback. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, morning mind for being here. 
and for the super chat. Um, yeah. and the kind where she says, thanks guys. Great show. Oh, that's an, you're not going to get it. Um, that, uh, Axio Super Bowl ring. Axio is, <laughs> this is so stupid. It's a Harry like, Potter. Is a, that a different language? What are we a, talking here? It's is a that, Harry. What? It's a Harry Potter thing. So like you say it, and then like you bring. So like say your remote control was over there, you'd wave your wand and say like Axio remote control, and then like the remote control would come to you. So she's basically saying like my hey, wife would get it. I don't. That's fair. <laughs> so she's basically saying like give me that Super Bowl ring, or like I like I send forth or I uh, summon for it. So that's awesome. That's you know very kind. And money and also Harry Potter. So that comment is just right up my Trifecta alley. Trifecta there. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much, Morning Mayan. <laughs> that doesn't get any better than that for me right there. <laughs> uh, no, that was uh, a great segment by, uh, once again, Jonathan Miller of Metro Roberts Realty. Um, a, a guy that uses a lot of the same technology when it comes to buying and selling homes that we do. You know, we try to stay up to date on, you know, we had questions even today in the chat, Anthony, like, hey. What, what analytics are you using? What, you know, what Telestrator are you using? Like all these different tools and technology to bring the film room to you guys. Um, and we're able to do that because of your guys' support. But also Jonathan Miller with Metro Robbins Realty does the same thing when it comes to selling houses. I mean, he's got drones, top of the line cameras, um, all this stuff, you know, in his base packages when it comes to, uh, again, buying or selling homes in Western New York. So if you guys are looking for a home or you're trying to sell your home, get a hold of Jonathan Miller at Metro Roberts Realty. Uh, we'll throw his phone number in the description. Give him a holler. I mean, he'll answer immediately and take care of whatever you need. Yeah, absolutely. It's, man, whether you're buying a home or selling a home, it's such a process that can be so stressful and so worrisome. And to be having somebody like Jonathan, who's so ahead of the curve when it comes to the technology aspect of it yeah. and the personal care piece of it. Um, I'm a sucker for animals and pets. So I love that he donates a portion of his commission from each sale to uh, rescue an animal. I just think that's a really cool uh, piece in touch. Justin says, what's a Harry Potter? Justin, get out. Um, you're no longer welcome here, but I appreciate you're you. You're on timeout. Yeah, you're out. You're done. You're done. I'll follow you. Yeah. Oh, come on, man. It's... Whatever. Yeah. But shout no. out to, uh, yeah, Jonathan and uh, all That's the work awesome. that he does. Yeah. So again, we went a little long today, but there's a lot to cover and we didn't even get to finish all the topics. But before we wrap real quick, Anthony, mm -hmm. we do have to give our reactions, which if you guys watch <laughs> us, you probably know what the reaction is, but your immediate reactions to the Bills trading Carlos Boogie Basham to the Giants and maybe what they got back for him um, since you loved him so much. Broke my heart. I've got 25 Boogie Basham jerseys. Um, just was a huge fan of him ever since he came out. I, I, I actually don't think I was as big a fan of his game as you were coming out. <laughs> so it's a little sad. Um, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful or like rude or negative. I wouldn't have traded anything for Boogie Basham. So the fact that they got anything in a return, I, and again, I don't, I don't, this is going to sound disrespectful. I don't mean it to be that way. If they would have got a bag of footballs back, I would have been like, oh, like, so I know it's a, it's a late round pick swap yeah. and it's not necessarily a, what it's not what you want to see considering you spent a second round pick investment. on a player. So yeah, you're not getting that return on investment you want, but, um, you know, I just I think it also speaks to the idea that he wasn't going to make this team. So the fact that they got anything for a guy that they were probably going to cut loose anyway, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is a credit to being in that crew. And I wish him the best with the Giants. You and I both talked about it with um, Bobby when he reached out to us from Talking mm -hmm. Giants. Like going with Wink Martindale, maybe Wink can unlock some pieces for him with his type of aggressive defense yeah. and the looks and the pressure packages. Maybe he can scheme some stuff up or unlock something in Boogie or – Maybe, you know, they change his frame and weight and they kick him inside more, or use him in those advantageous looks, but he just never really did it for us here in Buffalo. Uh, never seemed to really catch on against the run or the pass, really lacking from a pass rush moves and plan and transition standpoint. And again, you know, even coming into this off season thinking like, you know, maybe this can be the year, year three, we'll see what happens. And then really seeing him get outperformed by Kingsley Jonathan, who, uh, um, yeah, that's the bigger story here and, that and no that, one's talking about. I think that development to get yeah, like, it, it wasn't even so much that Basham didn't impress. It was that Kingsley Jonathan did and kind of played him out. of. He the team. made, yeah, he met the threshold of Basham's floor. Right. And so, yeah. and, and really surpassed it. Cause Agreed. as you said, we didn't see the pass rush plans, combinations come together. We didn't see him winning edges inside or outside on a consistent basis. And so yeah. I agree. I do think maybe in Wink Martindale's defense, that is a lot more complex when we're talking uh, different looks and 
you know, guys sending different types of guys. They have yeah. a lot of hybrid versatile mm -hmm. type guys. Maybe the scheme can draw up and, and conjure up some different edges and looks for him where he doesn't have to win a one-on-one -on -one edge. He can get that advantageous leverage and edge from the scheme. And so I think maybe there will be some success there, um, you know, if he continues to keep his head down and, and, and work. And, mm -hmm. But it, the conversation is Kingsley Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about him, so we didn't want to really hang too long on the topic of him. But kudos to him because, again, he elevated his game and he's progressed his game to the point where it made Carlos Boogie Basham expendable. And so we're talking the run. That's probably the area we've seen the most from him in development um, because he was not a guy that always could set an edge or mm. blow up a play. And, and he, he did that. And you haven't heard Eric Washington talk about that this preseason. But his pass rush plans are just some of the some of the best i will just mm -hmm. say for the defensive line especially off the edge he has multiple moves he knows how to set them up and when the first one doesn't work he has a secondary move and you see him process like that long arm I, we don't have the clip right now but that long arm he he compressed the pocket against the bears and he was right at the doorstep and most time most of the time pass rusher says um that's it you know i'm mm -hmm. gonna stop right there I, I i lost this rep no he converted it into a spin move and then hit the quarterback. So you just saw him develop more, and I, I'm so happy he made it because we're both stands of his and root for him. Yeah. Um, but, again, the conversation isn't necessarily how, you know, Boogie Basham really didn't develop in, per se, but it's about how Kingsley Jonathan made Boogie Basham expendable. Absolutely, and I think what also kind of has us gravitating towards Jonathan is – just he represents again, another kind of move away from what the bills have been at the edge from an archetype standpoint. Like he's got some juice. He's got some bend. He's got some mm -hmm. flexibility. Like you'll see him. There was the rep too. You know, you mentioned the long arm into the spin against the bears. The one I really liked, he beats the left tackle off the edge, right off the snap. The left tackle holds him, but he like dips under the hold and gets pulled and keeps working through it, but bends through it to draw the hold. Yeah. And then still get a pressure on the quarterback. He, you know, he stood out last year for his performance um, in the preseason from a pass rush perspective. I liked what he did against the Bears in season last year. You know, watching him, you know, play that surf technique against the Bears on Christmas Eve eat. or Christmas yeah. weekend. Yeah, like and just being able to hold his own there and make plays or make life difficult for Justin Fields in the open field. Like I was like, oh, like maybe this guy could beat something. And he came into camp and in the preseason and just kept finding little ways to shine against the run, but especially in the pass. And so, yeah, major, uh, major, major, major kudos to him for, cr again, cracking like a legitimately deep defensive line and edge group ring right now. And we'll see what happens once Vaughn comes back, but he's been a guy who's really impressed us, and we've highlighted him multiple times on the show. And, yeah. you know, we wish Boogie Basham the best, but I think the bigger statement or story here, Eric, to your point is, yeah, just – how tremendous uh, Kingsley Jonathan has been. And he earned that roster spot that he got. And to kind of wrap up, you know, guys like Alec Anderson, Ryan Vandemark, uh, Kingsley Jonathan making the team. I like the injection of young, fresher type players that maybe can execute the scheme and techniques that these coaches want. And just not the staff and front office hanging their laurels on guys that have mm -hmm. played a lot of, uh, of snaps in this scheme for these coaches. Hey, you're not performing anymore. This guy is developing. He has, a, again, Boogie Basham and Kingsley Jonathan. You, you hear the coaching staff talk about Kingsley Jonathan's motor and his, his ability to you know, be tenacious in, in, in 100 miles an hour. That's a lot of the same things we said about Basham, but he mm -hmm. also adds the element of a pass rush plan and yeah. pass rush moves that Basham didn't quite develop in. So I'm I'm excited about those young guys that we got to talk about tonight and that we've been talking about this preseason, injecting a different you know uh, set of players and personnel that have you know just different facets to their game is is really exciting to me when we're talking about the development of this roster, which they're going to have to even you know continuously keep developing yeah. with these contracts and the salary cap. They're going to have to keep developing these guys and we're, we're going yeah, to start thinking about not just this year, but three years from now and five years from now. Absolutely. You know, once more of Allen's contract kicks in, the Stefan Diggs contract kicks in further and you've got some of those heavier deals, you need these young guys on these cost controlled, cost effective contracts to play 
above their worth or above their initially perceived value. And Kingsley Jonathan is, is an example of that. And I think you can even say Al Anderson and some of the other pieces are sure. an example of that. And Eric, it's an exciting time moving forward. The preseason is done. Have, you know, if you're the bills, you have an off week during the week next week, uh, almost kind of uh, with that um, bills game coming up on the 11th against the jets. But for all intents and purposes, it's regular season football for this team. And really for us, as we start to move forward. So as we wind down here and start to focus on the go forward for us here, where's your focus at? Where's your head at? Preseason is done. The 53 man roster looks pretty settled, especially with the moves um, with a Fetty and with Kirksey. We know that there are some rumblings that the bills want to add another quarterback to the roster. So we'll mm-hmm. see what happens there, but for all intents and purposes, it looks like we've got the team that the Buffalo mm-hmm. bills are going to be from a roster standpoint right now. So where's your focus? Where's your head at as we move forward going into uh, next Monday night against the jets? You know, it's, it's funny because this season is, it's going to be a grind. It's, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and, Maybe not to the level of pressure that we saw last year, Mm -hmm. but I feel like there's a quiet confidence that this team is emitting, Um, you know, whether it's at practice, whether it's uh, in the games. uh, I feel like, you know, they're starting to realize, like, okay, it's time for business. And so Mm -hmm. um, I I think the front office has done a great job of, you know, structuring this roster, um, getting guys into place and again, bringing up the floor and, creating competition across all of the positions. So um, I I feel confident in this team and the type of scheme that they're bringing to the table Hmm. and the personnel they're bringing to the table. So um, with that, I I mean, we'll let you guys know about what we're going to be covering next week. If anything, Um, there's a possibility with some of the other stuff we have going on, we might not be able to run the show next Wednesday and there's no film anyway. So that doesn't mean you won't get any film from us. So there, there may be some breakdowns still, but, um, as far as the scheduling, um, uh, goes, I I keep an eye out and and we'll drop some news for, let you guys know, uh, what's up. Uh, we do, as I said, this can be a fun season Mm because we're, things are blowing up. Uh, we, you know, we're getting a lot of traction thanks to you guys. And then the players are reacting really well to the network and what we do here, especially in the film room. And so we're going to have several guys this season, um, coming in and joining us to break down film with us. And, uh, and we appreciate everyone that stayed here this entire, you know, hour and 41 minutes. Thank you very, yeah. very much. Uh, we don't want to hold you guys up too much longer, but if you're going to hang out on this, on the cover one sports channel, YouTube sports channel, Hang out till nine o'clock when the, the boys from cover one Buffalo go live here in about 20 minutes. I like Roy's idea for next week, Eric, Harry Potter film room next week. Let's break down some Harry Potter tape. Oh, he's not, a, <laughs> he's not about it. <laughs> uh, I think that's a tremendous idea. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm super pumped. You know, this is going to be a tremendous season. I think for this team and a tremendous season for us here at cover one with some of the things that you know, we've been working on and, and, and grinding towards. So a lot of excitement and it's also fun too, that I think the season kind of last year kicked off with a bang on that Thursday night against the Rams defending Super Bowl champs, but the Rams were a little bit of kind of like walking wounded this year. You're opening up on prime time. The last Mm -hmm. game of week one, it's against the jets in New York, a team that the hard knocks team with Aaron Rodgers that people are really kind of drooling over. And it's a division matchup against the team that, gave you problems last year and you split the season series with. So I think that adds a little more excitement and juice to opening week. And uh, I'm, I'm just tremendously excited for what we have cooking here at cover one, um, but also for this Buffalo bill season for the NFL season as a whole. So there's a lot to dive into um, as we go forward. And like Eric said, we wouldn't be able to do anything without all you folks um, on a large scale and in a small scale. So thank you very much to everyone who joined us live for this episode. If you haven't already, please, please, please. And thank you before you go drop a like on this video. It goes a long way towards helping us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears and significantly affecting that algorithm. If you are not watching live and you're watching later, that's cool as well. Please drop a like on this video when you are doing your post live viewing. Thank you very much to Morning Mayan for your super chat earlier. We significantly uh, and sincerely appreciate it, I should say. If you're listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review and subscribe, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, whatever have you. Um, Subscribe here to the Cover One Film Room on YouTube as well and to the Cover One channel as a whole. We have you covered legitimately six days of the week and then more content to fill up anything and everything you need, Buffalo Bills related or football related. Thank you very much to our sponsors. 
Nickel City Cigars, Easy Loan Auto Sales, and Mr. Jonathan Miller uh, from Metro Roberts Realty. We appreciate you know all the support yes. that you know you guys have showed us um, this off season. And Eric, it's always cool to kind of get that extra affirmation from the sponsors who recognize yeah. what we're doing here and um, want to be part of what we're building and kind of, you know, ride that wave with us. So huge. Thank you again to nickel city cigars, easy loan auto sales and to Jonathan Miller. All of the sponsor information can be found in the episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever one of the podcasting apps or platforms you are listening to this show on that will do it for us here. On another episode of the cover one film room and Eric, this is, officially the last film room episode but before regular season football i said it last mm. week it was i feel like we were just breaking down bill's bangles and then we were in mobile for the senior bowl and here we are we're basically in september and we got regular season yep. football around the corner a lot of things happen for the buffalo bills a lot of things happening for us here at cover one and we hope you folks will join us for every step of the journey along the way um also tell your family friends and loved ones about how awesome this show is and the channel is whether they're bills fans football fans whatever have you we appreciate you folks more than you will ever possibly know for myself anthony prohaska for eric turner this has been another episode of the cover one film room we hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe be kind to one another take care of one another we will keep you abreast of whether or not we're going live next week for another episode of the film room and until then Godspeed, and as always, 